Okay, good evening. Good evening, my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics here at Ryder University, an institution now celebrating our 150th birthday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On behalf of the Rebovich Institute and Ryder, I want to welcome all of you to an evening with the Honorable Vinny Prieto, Speaker of the New Jersey General Assembly. <laughs> this is our first official event of the school year. It kicks off our ongoing Governing New Jersey series. Uh, and let me just uh, be clear that this event is being recorded. Everything is uh, on the record. We are going to be recording it and it will eventually be posted to our website. The Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics has two primary missions. One is to raise the level of political discourse. With programs like tonight and the speaker, we hope to make everyone a little bit smarter. And when everyone is better informed, we can all have a more enlightened discussion about the great challenges that face our state. Now the second part of our mission is to train the next generation of political leaders. And therefore I am pleased to see the number of students uh, here, many of them in my classes who I basically told they had to be here, but I appreciate it nonetheless. The Rebovich Institute places a great emphasis on the benefits of political internships. We believe that they are tremendously beneficial to any student who wants to be involved at any point in their future in the political process. Unfortunately, many of our students are unable to participate in a political internship, regardless of the benefits that might come from it, because almost all of them are unpaid. And it's tough on a family to have a student do that. This is why we created the Rebovich Intern Fellowship Program to provide scholarships to our best students who are willing to take on the unpaid internship in politics, in government, and in public policy. So both parts of our mission, to raise the level of political discourse and to train the next generation of leaders, require significant support. Tonight, I just want to recognize several friends who have stepped up and supported this evening's program and our intern scholarship efforts, the Chemistry Council of New Jersey, the New Jersey Association for Justice, the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, the New Jersey Dental Association, the New Jersey Education Association, the New Jersey Utilities Association, and the New Jersey State League of Municipalities Educational Fund, Novartis, and Verizon. Please give them all a round of applause for their generosity. <laughs> Let me just uh, say this is how tonight's program is going to work. Uh, I'm about to introduce our honored guest. He will come up and he's going to begin with a presentation of an assembly resolution uh, and we will then immediately proceed to his speech. At the conclusion of the speaker's remarks, we will open it up for questions. Uh, we have uh, three student volunteers who will have microphones. Even if your voice is loud enough to carry, because we're recording this, we ask, the speaker will be able to pick whomever, raise your hand, uh, but wait till you have a microphone before you begin. It would be a tremendous help as we record the whole thing. And as is our tradition here at Ryder, the first two questions will need to come from Ryder students. So make sure you guys have good ones. Tonight's speaker, was raised in a very different time in a different place. Born in Cuba in 1960, his family came to this country in 1971. And over the years here, he learned a trade, he raised a family, and he got involved with government. Today, he is speaker of the General Assembly in New Jersey. And I think if you asked the Prieto family whether this was what they imagined for their ten-year-old son, Vincent, when they came to America. If you ask them whether they dreamed that this was the kind of rise that could be possible, if you ask them whether this is what they expected from their son in America, I am sure that the answer would be yes. It's exactly what they expected when they came to this country. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man who in many ways is the embodiment of the American dream, the Speaker of New Jersey's General Assembly, the Honorable Vinnie Prieto. Thank you, and when I get into my remarks, I'll, I'll see what I thought of where, where I was gonna end up. But first, uh, it's with great pleasure and, and, and an honor to present this resolution for Ryder, starting kicking off this week, the celebration for their 150th birthday. You started out as Trenton Business College and uh, became Ryder, and I know uh, Dean of Students, Dr. Campbell, is coming up, and this is, Absolutely. This is a resolution from the General Assembly recognizing Ryder for its accomplishments and not 150 more, a thousand more years. So good luck Thank and congratulations. Much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, sort of that was a little bit of glimpse. Um, I like to call myself, and uh, Ben uh, identified me as Vinnie Prieto, and Vinnie is who I am, and you'll get, I tell everybody, the best Vinnie Prieto you're gonna see here tonight. Um, I, I came to this country when I was 10 years old, actually just with my mom, um, and it was tough times. We went through a different, different life, different, uh, things that you don't see in this country. So for me, it's always with great pleasure. I take a lot of pride uh, in what I do, and every day is, is it's a good day. So a lot of people say, you're always smiling, and I see things uh, a little bit different than, than other people because I, I am living the American dream, and I think this is the greatest country that you, you can live in. Uh, we struggle a lot. I saw through a lot of things of uh, rationing and many things in those first 10 years of my life coming here, culture shock, not knowing the language, trying to learn aside from learning and your grades and trying to be a good student and stay out of trouble because my mom would have really taken care of me if I didn't. So that was one thing that I was always very mindful. Uh, we got a lot of help along the way and I think that that's what made me uh, civic minded uh, as I got older to be able to give back to the community and give to people a lending hand as I got when I was young and growing here and my mother and uh, coming from assistance, from everything and really understanding the needs of the people of New Jersey because I walked in those shoes and, and I know how difficult it is and that's why I fight for so many things. Um, I was a person that um, I wasn't the best of students. I was a good student, but I tell the kids when I go and speak at high schools, and I tell them I probably was one of those in the back that's not paying attention here right now, so I give a lot of credit to a lot of you here today that you're probably ahead of where I was at your age um, because it, it takes a while to evolve. So it, it's good that you are looking into the future, and you are our future, and that's why it's so important for the youth to get involved. Uh, I have a tremendous young man uh, sitting here, Cosmo Cirillo, that he represents me in Trenton, and I couldn't have a better person than that, and he's um, uh, amazing. What You gotta give an opportunity for the future to grow, and, and I think that that's something that, to me, I really strive for. Um, I started, uh, when I graduated high school, I started college. It was kind of difficult to, um, College affordability is something we'll probably talk about a little bit later. Um, and to my mother not liking, I sort of dropped out of college and went into the trades, uh, part because of necessity and something that I could start working on. Uh, we'll talk about trades a little bit later also. So I went a different route. I went into the trades and eventually did well for myself. I eventually was able to put a business but through that business and becoming a, actually a master plumber, I dealt a lot with building departments and the municipal government. 
and I helped a lot of people when I had my own business. They used to come to me to be able to help them in the community that I lived in because a lot of them didn't speak the language. So I would set up doctor's appointments. I would do many things for them and be a buffer for them as their voice into the municipal buildings. And I got to know many of the people. Uh, politics, it's kind of was never and really in my radar screen at that time, even though I was working toward it, which I didn't even know about. Um, I, I started going back to, to college at night to get my certifications to, to do what my daytime job is today. I'm a code official, so I oversee construction of buildings and I have inspectors that go out, I review plans. So I educated myself at night to be able to go into a different realm and went sort of into municipal government. Uh, I moved out of my childhood hometown, that was Union City, but eventually I became the construction official there also. Uh, my brother-in-law was the only one that had a vision for me, and he, he envisioned really this. And as uh, Ben was talking about, my parents said, never, never there was an anything you can't do. The sky's the limit. And I really, really want to stress that to the young people here. If you work hard, and you have perseverance, you will get there. Because I am telling you, people will notice, but you have to work hard, and you will be rewarded. And that was one thing that I had from being a small kid where I took garbages out for people and I was always hustling to make a buck. I told the story that um, when I got sworn in as the speaker that I came in at a construction site, and I probably was about maybe 12, 13 years old, and I was kind of small and I, and I was uh, under 100 pounds and there were 100 pound um, uh, rolls of roofing paper. And I told the guy, I said, you know, can I help? And then he goes, yeah, there was five flights. And he says, I'll give you a dollar a piece. So I said, wow, I counted how many there was. It was a ton. I said, oh, I can make a killing here. I probably carry about five and I almost killed myself. <laughs> After that, I went back to him and I said, listen, I can't complete it. You don't owe me anything. I said, but I can't do the job, just so you know. He never paid me actually either for any of the ones that I took up. So I learned that much, That, but it was fine. Um, but you at least have your word and you know, and I, and I went back, told him I couldn't do it. So that's another thing that was stressed into me by my mother. Have a word in life. And when I give you my word, I mean it. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's where, it, where it's going to go. So my brother-in-law was one that had a lot of high expectations for me. So I, I decide to move and have my, and I still say my kids, and they're 26 and 24 uh, today, and move out to a, a nearby town. And he says, you shouldn't move. You can be here a commissioner. It's a commission form of government in that municipality. You can one day be the mayor. And I said, no, nah. I said, I'm not interested. He goes, everybody loves you here. Everybody gets along with you. And I said, no, I'm going to raise my children. So I, I moved out. Nothing, you know, I start working in municipal government. My job was to make politicians look good. And that was my introduction into really politics. And they started noticing me as I worked hard, made sure I treated the people in the town, the, the residents, as if they were my customers. And I said, you know, because I had had a business, now I'm in municipal government. I said, it's no difference. You know, you like to be treated, you know, as, as you would be, you, know, you treat them. So I started treating them well. And uh, the first step was they asked me, do you want to sit on the planning board? And that was a step I said, sure. You know, I had the expertise. I was in construction. So it was a natural fit. So I sat on that, on that board, really not looking for anything in politics. And normally, you get the progression that you, you start a, a school board and maybe a councilman. So that, I guess, wasn't in my future. So I figured, I said, I went for the big time. So they came one day. and and approached me and they said, if a possibility there might be a vacancy in the near future uh, in the General Assembly, would you be interested? What do you think your wife will say? I looked and I said, I don't know what my wife will say, but I'm kind of shocked. Uh, I said, you know, we'll have a conversation. And so I circled back and I said, you know, I'd be interested if it comes up. So lo and behold, it came up and from, you know, uh, Nobody knowing me, I went to the state house. So it was kind of something kind of amazing. Now, 
that opportunity was given to me because of what I had been doing. Now, when you get an opportunity like that, you can do different things. You know, it's like being given the ball. You can fumble it or you can try and run with it. So I try to do my best. And I'm a student of the game in anything I do. I try to learn everything and, and understand it. And I see what the etiquette is and how, you know, uh, things should be and look at the history of it and then get really involved. I started, with, and I see some, some lobbyists here that every, every issue they come to me as a legislator, I would actually try to get educated on it. And that way, if, if I know the subject even better, because when you know what you're talking about, it's easy. But when you don't know, you know, you could be swayed either way. There's always an eloquent argument you can, you can make, and any one of you can probably take an issue and debate it from either side eloquently well. And anybody could do that. And that's why I've always thought of being fair. I've been called sort of a centrist because I sort of look things from the middle because I don't think you should be any extremist because I tell uh, some of these folks that, that are here that come to me and I said, great legislation doesn't work. Somebody loves it, somebody hates it. Good legislation we all can live with. And I think that that's what we strive for in Trenton. We strive for good. And, you know, and I can see some of we have talked here uh, that sometimes we agree to disagree. And if we're passionate about the issue, then that's, that's when, you know, you, you'll see that people take a stand. But there's always room for compromise. So I think it's kind of interesting in politics that there is a natural progression uh, I'm sort of kind of the exception, so when I'm here, I'm not the perfect model that you move along. But I did move along, but in a different way. I did it from the, in, in the back, uh, back of the room, and um, Joan Quigley wrote that, wrote that I normally have gotten in normally through the back door, but I try to make my way to the center of the room all the time. And that was because I've always felt confident that if you educate yourself, and like I said, hard work, you'll always do well. And I think that's the one thing that I can tell you to take away from here today, that in politics, it's about being civic-minded. And if you do that, people will notice, and that's what's important. And that's why for me, as uh, going back when I was a child in assistance, those safety net programs are very dear and near to my heart to make sure they're there to help the people. Not, not is as a handout, it's as a way for them to strive and keep going moving forward. Gotten, got to the legislature, so now I'm, I'm here, everybody, you know, the assemblyman, and I'm, you know, still Vinny. Somebody said to me, listen, don't change. Vinny's who we love. And I said, Vinny's all I know how to be. So to this day, that's who I am. And the issue is, some people change, maybe people change around you. You can't lose sight of who you are and what your goals are. So I came in from the trade. So my first thing was looking at some type of legislation, things that I always thought were wrong. I said, you know what? We license plumbers, we license electricians. We don't license the guys that install the boilers, that your ventilation, your cooling, your refrigeration. So I asked to have a bill written on HVACR. And I got that done, it took me about three years. So it moves, uh, the wheels in Trenton move kind of slowly, but they even move slower once you get them done because that bill got passed in December 17, 2007. And it's got implemented and it started the implementation this year in April of this year. So the licensing process is now, I, I kept saying, well, I said, I'm gonna take the bill, it was four years, I said, ah, it's going to pre-K, it's going to kindergarten. So, you know, it's almost seven years it took to get it done, but I got it done. So that was one of the things that was a highlight for me, that is something that I gave back to the industry that I came in. But you get interested in many other facets. You know, you look, to me, education is important. Unfortunately, I left it, eventually came back to it, my daughter is a teacher, it's uh, mathematics. She actually graduated at age 20 as a math major and started teaching at 20. Um, I think education is so important. Um, the state budget is over $12 billion. Out of 34 billion or so dollars that we spend, we spend more than a third on education, K through 12, and it's a 
free education for all our kids. So I think that was another thing that I've always strived to make sure for education. I moved through the ranks and I eventually became the chairman of regulated professions. You try and angle your way, see how you can get it. You get a title, I was the deputy majority whip, and you're trying to natural progression and seniority. If there's some movement, then you start moving up the, the ladder and eventually um, I became the budget chairman. And the budget chairman, I would tell you, is probably like the number three, you got the speaker, majority leader, and the budget chairman, that the budget chairman is the one that controls the budget hearings, the purse strings of the state, and that was, uh, for me, wonderful because that gave me an insight into what local uh, state government really is. And we deal with every aspect. You know, you're talking about 32 to $34 billion dollar uh, budget that we have, and that was something big for me to, to get to that point. Uh, but two years later, the opportunity arose to, to become speaker, um, and I went, uh, you know, and I lobbied my colleagues, and I was able uh, to, to get unanimously voted in by them, uh, which was a great honor for me. And now I'm speaker. I said, so what do I do now? I said, so aside from a hell of a lot of work, uh, I can tell you it's, uh, it's been a wonderful and rewarding process for me. Um, it's, it's an amazing day. Every day there's a fire you have to put out. So every, everything comes through, through my hands. Uh, you have to have great staff. That, that's important. You can't micromanage, but you, you know you sort of know everything that's going on, and they let you know, and you make ultimately the decisions. But when I first, I was figuring out to give a speech when I uh, got sworn in, and in that speech, it was a speech similar to this. I didn't read any notes. I just went off the top of my head. And I talked about certain things that I wanted to see done. And as speaker, I talked about vocational and technical education. Obviously, I came from the trades. We talked about school and how important it is. College affordability, that I had a problem with it, that that was kind of difficult. So there was different things we needed to talk about. And the one I thought is we've gone away from educational for our tech, uh, you know, our trades and our technical, uh, you know, people to be ready. So we need to see what the employers of New Jersey need in the workforce. And I think technical education is something that we need to work on. So that was a focus. And I'm here happy to report today that we had built, I had a uh, seven bill package that came through the assembly. We passed it out of committee, out of the, uh, the general assembly, um, the floor, and then it went to the Senate. It just came out of committee and it will be going to the Senate floor and hopefully to the governor to get signed. So that was one of the things that I envisioned to, to get done. Um, the other was the other facet of uh, education, which college affordability. So we've been working on a package of bills on college affordability because as you guys probably know, your parents, it's very difficult. And, you, you have this debt when you come out and hopefully there'll be jobs because our economy has been very difficult. So I've been working on that with some of my colleagues, getting some of those bills now are coming through committee and they're gonna be coming to the floor in the assembly and getting those done. Another thing I talked about it that I just spoke to my good friend, uh, Melanie Welby uh, earlier is um, earned sick leave. That, that's a very tough thing to talk about because it's, it's a difficult issue. Um, I think it's, it's the right thing, but how do we get it done? How can we get it accomplished? It puts a burden on the private sector, on businesses. Some municipalities have done it already, and I think it should be uniform, uh, you know, done uniformity through the state. So we're having that dialogue now, and I sort of talked to my caucus to have them educated. Another thing I did as speaker, and speaking of my caucus, I don't like to come in and just hit them cold with something because it's my idea or I think it's the best idea. No, I share with them and I have their input. So we talk about this and we basically talked about that uh, legislation the last session we had. Uh, my other goal was to make the assembly a relevant entity in the 
uh, scheme of things and the structure. There is two houses, the Senate and the Assembly, and then you have the executive branch, the governor. It's a three-legged stool, and without one, nothing works. And I said, I'm going to be relevant in the conversation, and, you know, not because I say it is. It was just a matter of us not being a rubber stamp to anybody. And um, I've tried to do that, and I think people sort of got it. Um, I have here, Bill Dressel was here somewhere. I don't know if Bill left, but the League of Municipalities, we had the issue with interest arbitration that we dealt with, and that was what police and fire that can really can't strike have to go, you know, and they would have to go to arbitration. And that, that law sunset. So we had to revisit that, some, that law. The governor did not agree with some of the things I wanted to be put in. So he conditionally vetoed. So I said we're going home and we went home and took a few months then it came back we sort of came to some compromise and got it done and it was just not about it wasn't about me or it wasn't about anything it was just the right thing I thought that police and fire needed to get something I got something it wasn't the world but we got something and I always tell everybody I'm not an optimist or a pessimist I'm a realist but I also look at the glass, not as half full or as half empty. If you have a little bit, you can always quench your thirst. So if you have something, you know what, be, ha be happy. And I think that that's something that I try to, some of my, my friends that come and lobby me, that I gotta explain to them, a little piece of the pie is always, is always good. You can always get fed. So I think that, that's the thing to, to take from here. Um, we, in the state of New Jersey right now, I, when I became the budget chairman, and as I said that in the state, I was going to say we have a lot of issues at this point in time. I became very stingy as the budget chairman, too, because I saw that how difficult it was. And the amount of money we have, the revenue streams we have are sort of limited. And you know what? You have to make ends meet with it. And I always tell everybody, and um, I always argued that the state of New Jersey has a revenue problem not a spending problem, a, uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. I said, we have a Republican administration that would cut government. If that's supposedly what they normally do, they haven't in five years, so I gather it's about the right size, so I figure our problem is revenues. Um, when, you know, um, the governor had been talking about a tax cut, I would see the numbers and I said, we can't afford it, and we love a tax cut, everybody does, but this is the problem we have. We have a lot of obligations that we have to meet. We had a falling out last year that revenues did not come in. So, apologize, should I shut these? Um, that the money did not come in as what we had hoped and our economy has been lagging behind all the neighboring states and it's been a difficult task and you know what? It's, it's really, I don't know if to blame, you know, blame anybody, but it's just been that way. We, we have not. So we have to do with what we have. And then what happens? Our credit rating has been dropped, so that costs you more money every time you borrow. Now, this, the things we're facing right now, one of the things that I've been passionate about is our transportation trust fund, that those are the roads you guys ride on, and you probably drive, you see that every road probably has a pothole, every street, every highway, and our road infrastructure is uh, deteriorating. Um, I gave a speech at Rutgers, uh, and I took some questions, and a young man said to me, well, he goes, when we talked about um, how do you fund it, and I talked, and I've, and I've had the, the, from day one, I started talking about we need revenues, and I talked about the dirty word, the T word, tax, whether it's going to be a gas tax, a sales tax, or a petroleum receipt tax. We need somewhere to get money to be able to fund for our roads. So this young man said to me, you know what? Gas is cheaper here. I like it, and I'm not impressed with our roads. The roads you have here, you know, they're not really that good. And I said, well, you just made my argument. We are cheaper. And our roads are not that impressive. I said, you know why? Because those are the roads I was riding on when I was your age. And that's why they need to be upgraded. And we can go into a lot of, a lot of 
detail because we spend about 1.6 billion is what we try to raise for our roads every year and the feds match that we're about 1.6 billion but we raise about 1.2 billion from uh, gas uh, tax that right now every cent of that is going to pay down debt so we're not raising your taxes on the gas but guess what we're raising your taxes and your kids taxes because that debt grows every year and it's costly and as we borrow it's really kicking the can down the road and you guys are the ones that are gonna be paying for it. So it's an education process. So I called on the transportation committee to start having hearings, which is starting tomorrow, to start having this dialogue, which I think is very important. So that's one of the things that is really facing us right now. We need to do it. After, after Minnesota had that um, tragedy, we did a survey of our bridges. 36% of them were either obsolete or structurally deficient. Guess what? We haven't gotten to, to all those bridges, and that's some of the things we're going to find out now. 11 million residents ride over them every day, so we want to make sure that, you know, it's not, it's being about proactive, not reactive, that we have another catastrophe, and then suddenly we have to react. So that's something that's important. But whatever we do, it has to be constitutionally dedicated, so we can't take that money. That money has to be put in. So that's trying to be a realist. How do we do that? We have a pension problem in the state of New Jersey. We have an obligation. We took a pension holiday for many, many years that we stopped paying into it. And even though the employees were paying into it, the state, since the budget supersedes anything, wasn't paying into it. So every time you don't pay into that fund, that unfunded liability grows. Right now, it's about $40 billion, the unfunded liability. This year, we made minimal payments. We were supposed to be paying $2.275 billion, and we paid about $690 million only into it. That in itself will make that unfunded liability grow. So the issue is, how do we fix this? Well, issue number one, we have to start paying into it. That's reality. Where do we get those revenues? That's what we have to figure out and have an honest discussion. And I've had this discussion with the governor. It's about not sound bites, and I'm not a big sound bite guy. I'm, I'm about doing reality. Um, those are some of the things, and I want to get back to, because I know you're politics. Now, uh, um, two years ago, I actually became chairman of the Hudson County Democratic Organization. So on the politics side, because I always tell everybody, there's two Ps, policy and politics. You say, well, don't mix politics with policy. They're mixed. I'm sorry to say, but that's reality. They're mixed. But you have to, a uh, good balancing act that you have to do. As the chairman of Hudson County, I've been able to do something that uh, Hudson County was always, everybody calls it for kind of ruthless in their politics. And I told, I always jokingly tell everybody, you see somebody lying on the ground, he's got a knife in his back. And they said, look, they stabbed him in the back. I said, where I come from? I said, you turn him around, he's got one in the chest. He saw who got, was coming, he got plucked. They just didn't want him to get up again. So it gets very, very, very odd, very nasty in, in our politics. What I've been able to do and bring back Hudson County to what its rightful place, it was always a, a it's a very Democratic stronghold. It's about eight to one uh, Democrats to Republicans. So if you're a Republican, hmm, you really don't, get, you got to move out of the county. That, that's, that would be the suggestion. But what we have done, there's been interests, and in mayors in my area, mayors rule. The municipalities are run by the mayors. They have their political machines. So my job as the county chairman is to put them together. I've been able to not, not have peace, but at least we're not at war. We get together. I have them meet on a regular base. And what I do is I have mayors only meetings, and I include the county executive, you can't send a substitute. So they attend, because if you want to know what happened, you got to be there. I have no leaks. Nobody ever talks about any of my meetings, because the interested parties are there. So it's nothing secondhand. Um, and that right now is bringing back Hudson County and uh, myself being able to be elevated to speaker has helped the county be noticed again as a very 
strong democratic hold. We give a tremendous plurality. We're not uh, the biggest county, but we do give uh, a lot of numbers. If uh, the state of New Jersey is blue, we're the navy blue of counties. Um, I know I could probably keep talking for a lot. I have no idea how long I've talked for, but I just tell you, and I tell the young people, um, hard work, perseverance, and you will be noticed. And if you do the right thing, and I'll, everything else, what my mom taught me, have your word, that you can control. There's a lot of things you can't control. Things change, but have your word. This is what you're gonna do. You try and do it, because that's, that will get you noticed. And if you work hard, those individuals, you will be promoted, and you will get there. And I say, if I'm the example of anything, you know, this is a great country. The sky's the limit. There's no glass ceilings that you can't break. So thank you. God bless each and every one of you. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions. All right. So we have, uh, so we've got three students uh, who are going to set themselves up in each section. I ask that you, if you have a question for the speaker, raise your hand. Mr. Speaker, if you could just point, but wait for the student uh, to, with the microphone to get there. First two questions have to come from Ryder students. This is your chance, guys. Come on. <laughs> Hands up. We're going to give you. How's it going? Uh, my name's Hunter Morgan. I am from uh, Rivervale, which is a small town up in Bergen County, for those of you who do not know. Um, just trying to gauge, what's your opinion on uh, shared services uh, weakening the municipality's uh, control? Great question. Um, I don't know if the League of Municipalities, I think Bill did leave, right? Okay, then we can talk. <laughs> now, uh, coming from the municipal side, I understand shared services very much so. Um, very important. A lot of municipalities are doing shared services. Um, the particular town that I come in, and it really helps to keep costs down. The municipality that I come from uh, had always done shared service, even within the municipality, whether it was their board of education, their library, their housing, and the municipal government, they would share uh, a plumber, an electrician, a lot of work was done in-house to be innovative, to be able to do things like that. Shared services, um, I've, I see that is something that's very needed. I come from Hudson County. Hudson County has the biggest shared service that was done in the 90s. They regionalized their fire. There was about six municipalities. Now, it's been a great success on one, on one aspect that the response time, efficiency, and how they deliver the service, second to none. You literally had, a street is what divides these towns. You had one firehouse here that couldn't respond to this fire because it was in a different town. So it actually, that all got done and it, it's been working great. But what has happened is some of these municipalities will tell you the cost of the service has, has gone up a lot. A lot of that had to do with when they merge, they, you have to go to who's the highest paid, so there's, there's a lot of issues to get that done. We have done legislation to be able to combat that and make it easier. Uh, Senate President Sweeney has a bill, I look at Andrew because he was his executive director before, uh, that, that's been his, his, uh, one of his goals to do. I sort of disagree a little bit on some of the aspect, the way that he has it, because it has more of a stick approach that somebody's going to dictate to you what you should be doing with shared services. And if you don't do what that person in Trenton, somebody sitting in Trenton, then I'm going to punish you and not give you the state aid that you get. And I think that sometimes from the outside, if I would tell some of my um, mayors that, okay, you're going to need to merge your police or your, you know, something of that nature, they may have a problem with it. Because a lot of times, the communities you live in, you choose them. And unfortunately, the state of New Jersey has 565 municipalities, and people like what they have. And I've learned that from working in municipal government. We, in these tough times, my town did a referendum this past year to uh, build a middle school, $28 million. So you would say, never would pass. They passed it because they like what they have. So sometimes we have to be mindful 
I think we should give incentives. And I think that was the biggest thing about that regional fire, the incentives that we created. You can't do them forever, but you have to give some incentives. So I think I'm all for it. We have to figure out what's the best way and the right approach. And again, I think the bill that the Senate president has is a good bill. It just needs to be, not maybe not a great bill, it needs to be a good bill, and we can get it done. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ross Stammer. Hi, Ross. Hi, I'm Ross Stammer. Hold, 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 hold close. I'm Ross Stammer. I'm from Voorhees, New Jersey. Um, you mentioned that we had a $1.6 billion loss in our pension fund amongst $40 billion other dollars completely lost just about. Um, how would you suggest we come to a solution with that? And is New Jersey actually trying to come to a solution long term? Yeah. Well, right right now, what I've been trying to do, I, I've been trying to talk to um, the, the key stakeholders, a lot of, of the union folks, and trying to talk to actuaries and figure out what what the problem, how we can solve it. And unfortunately, the, the way you solve the problem, you got to pay into it. And that's been the biggest problem. For, for many years, we hadn't. Uh, this, we made legislation about three, four years ago that over seven years, we were mandatory. We were going to put a seventh every year, and it would be paid. So we, we did our first seventh, our second seventh, and we did our third. When we got to our fourth is when we had a problem, and we did not fully fund it this year. So we have to figure out how do we get those revenues to be able to do all the things that, that we have to do. Do we look at efficiencies? Do we look at services? Uh, are we overlapping services anywhere? So we have to start taking a hard look how to do it. There's no easy answer. I could tell you here today, I'm standing here, I don't have the answer, to be honest with you, and I try to enlist a lot smarter people, and the only problem is you have to pay into the system because that unfunded liability, by not paying into it, it just grows more every year. When you talk about, I want to say it was in 08, probably the unfunded liability was about 12 billion. It's 40 now. So that's how much it grows if you don't pay into it. And unfortunately, through the 90s, in the early 2000s, there was almost nothing put into it. It was really a pension holiday, and we're paying for it now. So we have to look at it and, and really get it done. And unfortunately, we make changes to the system, but it's prospective. It really, the people in it already, that's something that um, is constitutionally, you know, belongs to them. So you really can't change a lot of it. So we have to start looking at it. We did pension and benefits and uh, the way public employees um, get health benefits, they're paying a lot more into it now than they were. They never really paid into it. So we've done things that has helped, but it still has not been the solution. So we have to figure it out and again, we have to figure out revenues. How do we spark this in economy? Because if, if the economy turns around, as our jobs we were talking, we haven't bounced back. I think New York is at 175% of jobs that when, they, uh, when the crash came in, we're probably only at 50% of getting those jobs back. And that's, that's the thing. We need to start figuring out how do we do, you know, our, get our economy to jump started. So, and, and pay into it is the first thing that every actuary tells me. If you don't pay into it, you have a problem. So we're working on it. Don't have the solution. Hopefully I can give you a good answer. Governor put a task force. I guess, he, I guess they put a, a, a call to a commission that is going to give a report. I actually said my first quote, first recommendation pay your pay it which i think is the right thing so we'll we'll entertain what they come with and we'll look at it all right all right hi my name is frank kellogg i'm from Piscataway, new jersey and i'm an accounting major here at Ryder. my question has to do with um a comment you made uh, about technical education earlier in the presentation yeah. So I'm a part of a career, uh, a career in technical student organization called FBLA, which uh, some people may know as the Future Business Leaders of America. There's uh, nine of them uh, in existence. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that as far as uh, how valuable they are to students' success in finding a career after college, if you've had any experience with these organizations? Well, I'm, I'm getting to know some of these organizations, and what we have done for technical and uh, 
education, um, we have partnered with business and industry and gotten them to, to sign on to let us know what's needed in the industry. And I think through these associations, together with the businesses, I think it's great because we can help these folks be able to uh, get into a career path that could help them. And a lot of times when you look at uh, technical education, um, you could make a great living, whether it's with a two-year degree or some type of certification. Sometimes it pays more than when you do a four-year bachelor's degree, you know, and, and a lot of times what's been happening, as you know, people graduate college and they have no job and they have a lot of debt. So I think that is, um, is something we need to look at. I also talk about that college, and we're sitting in a college, and I'm not advocating that not, uh, you know, nothing against college, but college may not be for everybody at that point in time. And it may be that they can start a technical education, be help them to pay for college later on. They want to reinvent it, and they make a good living. But I think those associations are very important because they shed light into it. They could network to be able to help them find jobs. So I think they're they're great, and I'm I'm always willing to. Uh, learn of new ones so that way we can try and see how we can be helpful. All right, Ben. Oh, we got one. No, no, he, he's got the question. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Matthew Rhodes. I'm from Woodbridge, New Jersey. I'm an intern in the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. No. And my question is, to what extent do you rely on polling or surrounding bills? On bills? Yeah. yeah. Poll Polling, we, we take it we take it serious, and polling I guess goes with one other, you know that's I guess that's another P uh, with politics. And like I said, everything is um, everything is relevant, and polling does work. Um, and I guess you guys that are taking these courses will, will learn that we use that as a gauge of something. If if you are going to make an effort that uh, it's not a futile effort. That is something that can be done. So polling is a key factor in a lot of things that we do. Um, listen, it's reality. For me to be speaker, there has to be a majority on the Democratic side. So we keep mindful uh, of even polling in those districts what, what works well. So a lot of times, like I said, policy and politics are mixed, so polling is very important because a lot of times there may be something that I think it may be great, but when you poll it, it, it doesn't poll well. So listen, why would you take that, uh, that risk? But also polling, you have to be very mindful, depending on what, how you ask the question. About the Transportation Trust Fund, I can tell you this. They said, oh, it polls really bad when you talk about raising gas tax. Of course it does. If you tell somebody, I want to raise your taxes, you're going to say no. But if you educate the person and say, you know, what would you rather, raise the tax on gas or <coughs> borrow, and it's going to cost you more money down the road, then people, then, then the pendulum swings the other way. So polling is a very important tool that we do use. Mr. Speaker, let me ask you, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the uh, sort of the dual side of your mm -hmm. role in, uh, in government, both as a legislative leader and as a political leader. So can you give us your assessment of the gubernatorial field after Chris Christie? Who do you think has an inside track? What is your take? Is there a certain Hudson County candidate you might be favoring at this point? We're look, I'm looking for your insights. Well, uh, and in addition, specifically, do you think the governor is going to fill out the rest of his term, or do you think at a certain point with his presidential ambitions he's going to leave early? You ask a lot of questions. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got you here. <laughs> no, I, I really don't, because the first thing that I'll tell you, I, I talked to one of those potential uh, that you probably are reading about, potential candidates. Um, and basically I told them, I said, what you're asking me is hypothetical. And I deal in reality and everything that we be talking about, we don't have a vacancy right now. This governor is what, on his ninth month of his second term. There's still a long way to go. So I really don't think there's any candidates. Uh, I haven't seen anybody says I'm running for anything, so I wouldn't tell you um, 
who's the favorite and who's not. Um, so on that realm, I think that we have to be realistic. There's no vacancy right now. The way I look at it, and this would be my opinion about the governor, I think the governor is the governor of the state of New Jersey. I think right now I don't see him leaving anytime soon. Um, I think the governor has something very powerful on his side right now, if he decides to run for, for president, that he steps outside his office and he says, press conference, and everybody has all those cameras there in 15 minutes. If he's no longer the governor, I don't think he has that microphone any longer. He's the former governor. So I think that is, in my opinion, a reason to stay and I think there's nowhere to go right now. So I feel, and somebody asked me today about his, you know, whether he's running or not. I said, listen, he's the governor of the state of New Jersey. There's a lot of issues here, as you talked about pensions uh, before. We have to take care of, so we have to take care of home first, and I think that's important. And that's the thing that everybody that asks me their best advice on politics, and I tell all my colleagues when they come in, and I forgot to tell you this, I said, you take care of home first where you run from, that's priority number one, because home is what gets you there. If I don't take care of home, no matter what I am or what titles I have in Trenton, if I don't get back to Trenton, it doesn't mean anything. So you always take care of home. And that's why I said we have to take care of home now. But I think right now there's no vacancy, so we'd be talking hypothetical. So you're gonna get somebody mad at you. So obviously, <laughs> it's not my, not my style. And there is, you never know. Everybody in this room probably remember I told you this. You may be surprised who maybe the candidate is. God knows who that may be. Anybody else? I got another one. Yes. You emphasized hard work a lot during your speech. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you went from nobody to state house. What was the hard work you put in on your local campaign to get to the state house in the first place? Well, what I what I sort of if you didn't see the part that I, uh, I, I told you is I, w I work behind the scenes making politicians look good. So everything they took credit for, it was something that I had been doing in my municipal work as, you know, uh, working in the, ba in the backdrop. So that's why I said to you, you get notice. And I first was asked to sit on a planning board. And then when this opportunity came, they noticed that I had the right fit and they had the vision. And, and obviously, I guess they were right because I'm the speaker today, 10 years later, so I guess their vision was good. But the hard work that I put in, and it all depends how you do it. And mine was working in the backdrop. And you may work on a campaign for somebody and they see how, what a hard worker you are. That person gets to whatever that office is and then they may hire you and then that's how you start and you start learning from the from really the weeds and you start learning from the bottom so my hard work was put in not on the politics i've said mine wasn't conventional it wasn't the person that decides to you know i'm going to run for uh board of education and gets elected and it's a popularity contest so they get elected to that. Then eventually they're there for a while and then they run for council and then they're there for a while and it all depends. Mine was actually real work and the way I look at it, and I, not that they don't do is not real work, but it was actually getting things done. It was reality because my, I actually run five departments is was, was what I did in the town and I actually oversaw five departments that made a lot of difference to, to the people in the town. So when I still run in my town, even though it's mayor's rule, I actually have a good relationship with my mayor, but we are actually kind of neck and neck. He always beats me by a little bit, which I like it. I said, you know, you're the mayor, I shouldn't be beating you. So, but we're both known, we're both liked, and he actually says it best. He says, they like him, they like me, but when we're together, they like it better, so it's good. But that was the hard work. It was behind the scenes, so that's what gave me my opportunity. I'm sorry? Oh, in, the, in what I did for them, you mean? 
well, in, on the campaigning side, I helped a lot of times. And obviously, working in the town and a lot, I was very well known, so it was easy for me to go out. I would go door to door with them. I would get on the phones, and I did all those things that everybody does in politics. And we get the vote out, get everybody, and you, and you work your way in. Uh, the only thing I skipped was those other levels, but I did everything that everybody does in politics, and it's very important. Every vote counts, and you can't take anything for granted. So getting the vote out, delivering literature, putting lit literature out there, you know, knocking on doors, and, and you're always out when the campaign is on, whether if it's for November after Labor Day, you start and you don't stop until basically the polls close. You keep calling, and you're on your cell phone and calling and making sure so-and-so hasn't come in. You look at your sheets and all that. So those are the things that you definitely get noticed by, by working hard. I want to thank uh, the speaker. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, evening. I'm sure he'll make his uh, way out, but we hit 8 o'clock, so I want to make sure uh, we can everyone have a, a safe trip home. Let me just, once again, we have some uh, wonderfully generous sponsors, and I greatly appreciate many of them, are, our representatives of them are here tonight. So thank you all for your support. We look forward to seeing you October 8th, when we will have Jeffrey Bell uh, here in this very room. Look forward to you at that next event. It'll be quite different, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Have a safe trip home.